So my personal story and how I came to be a facilitator here is that I was first diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2006. Um, I had a did lumpectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, I guess the, the usual. And then I had a recurrence back in uh, 20 and 12. And at that time, I had a bilateral mastectomy, chemotherapy again, no rads this time. Um, and then I was diagnosed metastatic in 2016 to bones. Um, and at that point, I started going to UCLA as a patient. I do, um, right now I'm on Ibrance and Letrozole. And I was on Exgeva for about a year and no longer. Um, I had some direct treatment on my bone mets, and so I've had no um, evidence of active disease for almost two and a half years now. So that's my status. Thank you. And it's my honor to present Dr. Mary Tediff. She's an oncologist at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, she received her undergraduate education at Princeton and went to Harvard Medical School, so, you know, she knows what she's talking about. Um, she's working at the UCLA Health Sciences, uh, she's working at UCLA as a health sciences clinical professor. And she's out of the Laguna Hills location, and she specializes in the prevention and treatment of breast cancer. She's co-authored and authored numerous publications, um, and she currently participates in many clinical trials through the UCLA Clinical Research Network. So please help me welcome Dr. Tata. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So we have half an hour to go through a, a bit of information, so I'm going to try to go fairly quickly. Um, so triple negative breast cancer, it is really defined by what it does not have. It does not have estrogen and progesterone receptors and does not have HER2. It accounts for approximately 20% of breast cancer worldwide or approximately 200,000 cases diagnosed a year. Triple negative breast cancer is more common in younger women, in women under the age of 40, in premenopausal women, in African American women. It's more common in women who have the BRCA gene, particularly BRCA1, more than BRCA2. And it actually is a higher risk in women who have a history of obesity when they're premenopausal. So in terms of um, BRCA, the BRCA gene and triple negative breast cancer, so this slide's a little bit complicated. Um, for BRCA1 carriers, about two thirds of the breast cancers those women develop are triple negative. As compared to BRCA2 carriers, only about one quarter of those cancers, if they get breast cancer, are triple negative. And to look at it the other way, of the women who have triple negative breast cancer, 20% are associated with BRCA. So the majority of women who are BRCA1 positive who get breast cancer will have triple negative breast cancer. It's a much smaller percentage in BRCA2 carriers, and about 20% of women with triple negative breast cancer, I'm sorry, with triple negative breast cancer will also carry BRCA gene. In general, women with triple negative breast cancer who are age 60 or younger should have genetic testing for the BRCA genes due to the higher risk of association. In terms of how these cancers behave, they usually tend to be more aggressive or faster growing. Most of them are invasive ductal rather than invasive lobular or other types of breast cancer. They do are more aggressive and therefore have a worse prognosis or worse outcome statistically but these are not type, the types of cancers that will spread late. Hormone positive breast cancer can hang around the body and occur years later. Triple negative breast cancer, if it is going to spread, usually will do so within a few years after the initial diagnosis. In terms of recurrences, it tends to be less likely to spread to the bone as compared to hormone positive breast cancer, but may recur locally or in the lung or even the brain uh, as more common locations. Triple negative breast cancer is not one disease, which makes it hard for us to find treatments that can work for everybody with triple negative breast cancer. 
in breast cancer in general, we're leaning more towards looking at molecular or gene expressions under the microscope to try to look at the different features of breast cancer. And there are many what we call subtypes of breast cancer. There is a term called basal-like, which when you look at these molecular or gene changes, it, these look similar to the cells that line the breast ducts. And basal cell breast cancer accounts for about 70% of triple negative breast cancer, but it doesn't account for all of it. We are aware of six other, right now, six other subtypes that exist based on these molecular or gene classifications. And so as we go forward in better defining all of the different subtypes of breast cancer, including triple negative breast cancer, we're trying to look for certain features of these cancers under the microscope that will help us to give targeted or, or directed therapy at these changes under the microscope. This is the way breast cancer um, management and management of most cancers is heading in the future. So how do we treat triple negative breast cancer that has spread or metastasized? Chemotherapy, which basically treats fast-growing dividing cells, is certainly the mainstay. There are drugs called PARP inhibitors. There is immune therapy, treatments called antibody drug conjugants, and androgen receptor inhibitors. And we're going to be touching on each of these in the course of this talk. These are the medications that we use to treat the breast cancer once it's spread. The treatment may vary based on the prior chemotherapy that the person has received, if they have a BRCA mutation. But we know chemotherapy can be very effective. Chemotherapy stops growing dividing cells, and triple negative breast cancer, because it often grows quickly, can be very susceptible to chemotherapy. We have many different chemotherapy options. For women whose cancer has spread, we often use single medications intermittently rather than use multiple medicines at once. And this is a list of some of the medications that are used in treating triple negative breast cancer. There are the platinum agents, we call cisplatin and carboplatin. The taxanes, which are taxol, taxotere, and abraxane. Aribulin or halivin. There's some evidence that if women have had their cancer spread after one of the taxanes, that this drug may be particularly effective. Capecitabine or zolota is the oral chemotherapy that we can use in this setting. Anthracyclines, such as adriamycin or similar medications, gemcitabine, which is also called gemzar, and others. So we have a wide range of chemotherapies which may be effective in treating triple negative breast cancer. And again, chemotherapy in general works to stop growing dividing cells. There was a trial that came out a couple years ago called the TNT trial that compared carboplatin with the drug ta taxotir or docetaxel. And in women who are BRCA carriers, they found that the platinum agent was a bit more effective. So we often will look to using uh, one of these agents, usually carboplatin, but also cisplatin in women who've had triple negative breast cancer. They may be, and, and are BRCA carriers. So this group of drugs may be a bit more effective in people with BRCA-related triple negative breast cancer. So let's switch gears and talk about a different group of drugs called the PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors work on, dam on, on affecting DNA repair. So we have the enzyme PARP in our bodies. We all have that in our normal cells. And what that does is help to repair our DNA when it gets damaged. Our body and our cells are going through changes all the time, and our DNA, which is the basis of those cells, can be damaged by many things in our, in our body. We have this enzyme called PARP that helps to repair that to allow our body to heal and not have changes that are harmful. The medicines that are PARP inhibitors prevent that repair. So when DNA gets changed in a cancer cell, the PARP enzyme may not allow it to be repaired in the abnormal cell. When you give an inhibitor, it helps to um, block the repair of the cancer cells so that the cells will die. In other words, we have a normal mechanism to allow our body to heal. The PARP inhibitors try to make the cancer cells not heal, and that's the way these work. Faster growing cells are more susceptible to the PARP inhibitors than our slower growing cells, so that when we have cancer cells and they tend to grow more quickly, these PARP inhibitors may be more effective. There are two of them that are now FDA approved. They are approved for women who have BRCA-positive breast cancer that is also HER2 negative. So that would apply to women with triple negative breast cancer. 
These are oral medications. And when they did quality of life studies on women who were taking the PARP inhibitors compared to chemotherapy, their quality of life was felt to be better. In addition, it helped to prevent the cancer from spreading, what we call progression-free survival. It helped to prevent that cancer from spreading by a few months. And we hope as we use these drugs and other combinations that that number, that period of time will get extended. In addition, if you look at what we call the disease response, what percentage of the women had their cancer shrink, it was twice as effective in terms of causing sh cancer shrinkage compared to chemotherapy. Women felt better on these drugs, and there are newer medicines that are being developed in this class of drugs. So this is a field that is growing. Right now, these medications are used in women with BRCA, um, HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer. In terms of the side effects, they can lower the blood count, so lower the red cells, which is anemia, the white cells. Uh, Talazarpariv also can lower the platelet count. They can cause fatigue and nausea, so even though they're oral medications, there can be some side effects, but in general, they tended to be well tolerated. In the future, where may we go with research with these agents? Well, we can potentially combine them with immune therapy, which we're going to be talking about in a minute. There are a number of agents that target other mutations in the cells, and later on in the talk, I'm going to show a diagram of how some of these fit into cell division. It's unlikely these will be used with chemotherapy because they both lower the blood counts, and when you use two medicines that cause the same side effects, you have to lower the doses of both of them to give them safely. So probably PARP inhibitors will not be used regularly with chemotherapy. They'll be used alone or in combination with some of these other medications. So immune therapy, this is certainly a very hot topic in cancer treatment right now. Our immune uh, system is very complex, and in cancer it's very complex. Our immune system is structured so that our body can recognize something that is foreign or damaging and try to get rid of it before it causes problems in our body. In order for our bodies to recognize cancer and fight it, we have to see cancer as different than our normal cells, and cancer cells are very good at hiding and having the body not recognize them. In addition to the, bo the uh, body having to be able to recognize the cancer cells as being different in our immune therapy to attack them, we have to be able to get immune therapy into the cells, the cancer cells, to make it work. So we need something on the cancer cell that our body sees as different from our normal cells so it can attack it. We have to have immune cells in our body be able to be present and then be active to fight the cancers. And so these are the steps that have to be developed to make an immune therapy work, so it's rather complicated. There are normal structures, molecules in our body called checkpoint, and these are called PD-1 and PD-L1. Um, these basically prevent our body from attacking normal tissue. So we often, our immune system is often active, and when people develop what's called an autoimmune disease, it means their body is attacking themselves. There's something in their body they don't recognize, uh, they don't recognize as part of themselves. They see it as foreign, so our body, uh, their own bodies attack it. We have these, this structure called PD-1 and PD-L1 to try to prevent our bodies from attacking normal tissue. The cancer cells are very smart, and they use this system to try to hide from the immune system so that our body cannot recognize this, the cancer cells as being foreign. So these checkpoint inhibitor molecules basically allow our bodies to recognize the cancer cells as being abnormal so our immune system can then attack the cancer cells. And I have a little sort of drawing here. The T cells that are listed here are part of our immune system. They help our body fight things that are abnormal. We have the cancer cell here in the other corner. PD-1 and PD-L1 are helping to prevent our own T cells or immune system from recognizing the cancer as being abnormal. The cancer cells have been very smart and try to hide from our immune system. When you give one of these medicines called checkpoint inhibitors or antibodies, they then allow our body, that T cell, to see the cancer cell as abnormal. So the cancer cell has found a way to protect itself from our immune system. These medicines help our body recognize the cancer cell as being foreign. And so these drugs are called immune therapies. When these drugs have been used in triple negative breast cancer, we have found that it's better when used earlier in the course of the cancer spread. 
In the women for whom these treatments work, they can be effective for a very long time. We don't yet know specifically which women with metastatic triple negative breast cancer will benefit from using these medicines as single agents. We're learning more about that as research goes on. But we know they also potentially can be used in combination with chemotherapy or other medicines. So we can attack the cancer by using the immune pathway and then perhaps also attack the cancer by stopping cell growth with chemotherapy or using other medicines that attack cancer cells differently. This is a list of the checkpoint inhibitors of these immune medicines that are used currently to treat various forms of cancers. A number of them are FDA approved in other diseases. The Keytruda is um, being advertised all over television for lung cancer, um, Optivo also. Some of these other treatments are used in uh, um, G or urinary cancers and various forms of skin cancers. So this is a a blossoming field where these drugs are being used in all different sorts of diseases to find out where they fit. So with immunotherapy, because you are revving up your immune system to attack the cancer cells, it potentially can result in autoimmune type of processes where our body is attacking itself through the immune system. People can get what's called pneumonitis or inflammation in the lungs, can get colitis or inflammation in the colon, can get hepatitis or inflammation in the liver, or a variety of these other areas where your own immune system, when it gets revved up, thinks those areas are abnormal and attacks them. These are rare but potentially serious side effects with immune therapy, so we need to watch very closely how people tolerate these treatments so that we don't have these serious potential autoimmune side effects. There was a drug called the Impassion trial that was done in women with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And it was done for women who had first line treatment for their triple negative cancer. It combined the chemotherapy abraxane, or also called NAB paclitaxel, with the um, uh, immune therapy. What's <laughs> that? Um, NAB paclitaxel with the, uh, the um, immune agent tisentric or atezil, I'm sorry, atezolizumab. Thank you. Um, <laughs> easy to say. Um, they found that the immune therapy, I'll say tisentric, um, was a benefit in the patients who had what's called PDL1 positive cells. So there's a way to test the tumor, the immune cells actually in the tumor, to see if they have that PDL1. That accounted for 40% of the women with triple negative breast cancer on the trial. And they found that adding the immune therapy to the chemotherapy improved progression free survival, meaning that the cancer did not spread for a longer period of time. The immune side effects on this treatment were low. Some people had um, autoimmune attack on the thyroid, so their thyroid got low, or they had pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lung. But statistically, people did well, and those side effects were not terribly common. They found that the patients, those 40% of the women who had the PDL1 positive cancer, lived almost a year longer being on the immune therapy. And so this is very promising, and it led to the FDA approval of this combination, the immune therapy with the chemotherapy, the tisentric with the abraxane, for women with metastatic or advanced triple negative breast cancer whose tumors had this PDL1. And so again, this accounts for about 40% of women. This is very promising, it's very exciting, and it will, this is the first trial that showed the significant benefit and that people live longer by getting this immune therapy. There's gonna be a lot more research as this gets expanded and we try to find the role of how these immune therapies work, whether it's in combination with chemotherapies or combinations with other medicines that will help us um, to attack the cancers. Hopefully we're gonna find other what we call markers, not just the PDL1, but maybe we'll find something else in the cancer cells that suggests that these immune therapies will be effective. Right now, this combination is felt to be the new standard of care first-line treatment for women who have had metastatic triple negative breast cancer. It will be this combination of chemotherapy and tisentric. One word on the abraxane or the nab paclitaxel. It's a weekly chemotherapy that is like taxol, but it is um, 
encoded in a surface that helps prevent allergies. For those of you who have, re who have received Taxol or Taxotere, um, we, you know we give anti-allergy medicines and some people do get allergic reactions. This medication, because of the way it's, it's structured, basically really helps to prevent those allergic reactions. And it tends to be uh, better tolerated from that perspective. So let's switch gears and talk about something called androgen receptor. Um, androgen receptor is like the estrogen and progesterone receptor, but it's something that is really selective for, similar to testosterone, the male hormone. Men have androgens like women have estrogens, but we have normal androgen receptors in low quantities on breast tissue. The role of blocking this receptor in breast cancer is being explored and has had some conflicting results over time. Up to 50% of some studies show that triple negative breast cancer can have what's called the androgen receptor. And yet there are many other sub, what we call subtypes or different types of androgen receptors. So we're not yet clear which medicines may block androgen receptors to help triple negative breast cancer. Just like in hormone receptor positive, estrogen repos receptor positive breast cancer, we give medicines that block estrogen. There are medicines that can block this androgen receptor. It's an area of active research. It's not yet available um, off of research studies. These are some of the agents that target the androgen receptor. They're oral medications, and they're used right now in prostate cancer because prostate cancer grows in the presence of androgens or testosterone. Uh, we anticipate that there will be a role for these in triple negative breast cancer, but we're trying to find out which patients and which type of androgen receptors will benefit from this treatment. So the androgen receptor inhibitors in triple negative breast cancer are being evaluated in clinical trials. They may be effective alone for some, for some women. They may be effective if we combine them with anti-estrogens, and they may be effective if we use them with chemotherapy or other what we call targeted treatments. So this is an active uh, role of, I'm sorry, this is an area of active research right now. I'm not yet ready for use for everybody, but hopefully we're going to learn more about this in the near future. Antibody drug conjugates are a very exciting field in treating breast cancer, uh, probably all types of breast cancer, not just triple negative. And it's what we call smart bomb technology with the concept that we are trying to get uh, the medicines, whatever's going to kill the cancer cell, chemotherapy or whatever medicine we're going to give to kill the cancer cell, directly into the cancer cell without trying to kill the normal cells around it. You try to give chemotherapy in a very high dose right into the cancer cell so there's less toxicity to the surrounding tissue. Many of these antibody drug conjugates are being evaluated in triple negative breast cancer. So this is the concept. Um, an antibody is um, something that we have normally in our body that's part of our um, immune system and, and part of our system to um, basically, they're proteins. And what, what they do is they can attach to um, surf, things on surfaces of cells. And the concept is that you have this antibody that has what's called selectivity that's mentioned at the bottom where it targets or attaches to something specific on a cancer cell. And we can see here that it has this drug that's attached by a linker, meaning you have a chemotherapy attached to the antibody. So it's delivered directly into the cancer cell. And let me show a better picture here. So you have what's called the antibody attached to the drug circulating in the body. It is going to bind to something that is specific on the cancer cell. It then goes into the cell and releases the chemotherapy or the toxin into the cell so that you are specifically delivering chemotherapy or something that's going to kill the cell into the cancer while sparing normal cells. So just to uh, give a list of some of the types of medicines that are used on research in this area. There is a drug um, that's um, very exciting right now and is going to be probably close to FDA approval in the near future. It attaches to something called trope 2, which is on the surface of 88% of triple negative breast cancer cells, but only on about a third of normal cells. So the idea is when this attaches to the trope 2 on the surface, it then delivers a chemotherapy inside. 
hopefully it will attach mainly to the 88, those, those triple negative breast cancers, the majority that have the trope 2, and to a minimal amount of the normal cells, so you will minimize side effects. There is something called LIV1, LIV1. That's expressed in about two-thirds of triple negative breast cancer and very minimally on normal cells. Therefore, we expect that when you have the antibody that targets the LIV1 and gives the chemotherapy inside the cell, it really won't attach to normal cells, and we expect that it will be specific for getting into triple negative breast cancer cells and hopefully be able to eliminate those cells with minimum side effects to other tissues. There's something called GPNMB that is expressed in almost a third of triple negative breast cells and in minimal normal cells. Again, it's a way to try to give chemotherapy specifically into those cancer cells while sparing normal tissue. So that's why this term smart bomb technology came up. You're giving what's going to kill the cells directly where they need to go. That's the smart concept and trying to save normal cells. There's another way to attack cancer cells through a pathway called AKT, and there is a trial going on called, uh, that, I'm sorry, that went on called the LOTUS trial. About 25% of the patients had mutations or changes in this pathway. Everybody received paclitaxel, which is a taxol, taxol which is chemotherapy. Half of the uh, patients also received this oral medication, which targets what's called AKT, and they found that basically it helped the chemotherapy be more effective for longer. It improved the time to cancer progression. This is now being done on a large trial. So in terms of what are the approaches going on in research right now, we can attack DNA repair to prevent the, the cancer cells from being repaired when they're damaged. That's what the PARP inhibitors can do. There's this other uh, pathway that is called the PI3K pathway that it also is very active in hormone receptor positive breast cancer, where there are a number of agents, many of which are oral, that are trying to stop cell growth by targeting that area of uh, growth through that PI3 pathway. There's the androgen or testosterone signaling. We talked about the androgen receptor on the surface of the cells. These are oral agents that are being investigated on trials. The antibody drug conjugates, or the smart bomb technology we discussed, where the chemotherapy is selectively put inside the cancer cells by targeting something on the surface of the cancer cells. There are agents that stop cell growth or cell cycling. There's something, uh, the CHK1, there's a medicine that's being looked at to stop that part of cell growth. And then these other ways, antiangiogenesis is looking to stop uh, blood cell development in cancer cells. So the research is looking at focused ways to try to selectively stop cancer cell growth. This is changing and growing all the time. And it's based on how cancer cells and normal cells grow. And we're looking at what's called molecular profiling, looking at the cell cycle or cell division and looking at areas of cell growth that we can target specifically and selectively in cancer cells. This is just a a slide that shows a fraction of the way that we're trying to target uh, cell division and looking at different agents that will, atalk, uh, uh, will attack certain areas of cancer growth. Um, and so we are looking at defining cancers not so much about where they start in the body, but more what they have on the surface or inside of them that can help us attack them. And so, for example, HER2 positive breast cancer is one form of breast cancer for which we use medicines like Herceptin that target HER2, but we use Herceptin in stomach cancer. We can use Herceptin in esophageal cancer, and it's being looked at in other types of cancers that have HER2 on the surface. So in the future, cancer treatments may not be based on the part of the body where the cancer started, such as the breast. It may be based on the changes inside or on the surface of the cell that help us direct therapy. So the medicines that are being looked at in triple negative breast cancer can be looked at in cancers that start in other parts of the body that have those same changes, whether it's an androgen receptor or whether they have maybe that trope 2 on the surface. We may see that in other types of cancers besides triple negative breast cancer. And that's really where oncology treatments are heading, very personal uh, ways of treatment. So I am uh, part of UCLA faculty. My office is in Laguna Hills, and we 
I, I have access to the breast cancer trials that are being done up at UCLA, and so I just want to quickly go through some of the studies that we have available for women with triple negative breast cancer. We have protocols with PARP inhibitors. We have protocols with immunotherapies that work with, uh, in combination with other types of treatments, including viral therapies and um, other medicines that target other parts of cell growth. We have three of the antibody drug conjugates trials that, uh, that smart bomb technology. We have medicines that target another uh, part of the pathway called CDK246. This has uh, been shown to be helpful with the drug Ibrance, for example, in women with hormone-positive breast cancer. We are doing uh, research on this in triple-negative breast cancer. So triple negative diagnose, uh, breast cancer is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning it does not have ER, PR, and HER2. It's multiple different diseases, but we are trying to tease out what those cancers have for which we can give localized or targeted therapies. And in the future, we may be testing for these different things on the surface or inside the cancer cells to try to give more specific targeted therapies to these types of cancers. And clinical research is bringing newer and more effective therapies, and this is a rapidly growing, exciting field that I think is going to keep changing, and it's going to help women who've had metastatic triple negative breast cancer live better and feel better over time. Thank you. So um, I think that the, this is in a way a sort of a form of immune therapy in that we are looking for something specific on the surface of the cell to target. Immune therapy in the group of drugs I was talking about before works differently. I don't, I mean, I don't know what the future is, but I, I think that the concept of the smart bomb is to deliver something inside the cell that stops cell growth. Immune therapy is used to recognize the cancer cells as being abnormal. So that technology most likely would not be mixed. So I assume that we're talking about one of these studies like Foundation One or similar um, testing. So the concept of genomic testing is to text the ch uh, test the cancer to see what are the changes in the cells to help us determine um, if there are any um, direct targeted or directed treatment for those um, cancer cells specifically. It goes back to what I was saying before where we're gonna be trying to tease out specifics of cancer cells to have targeted therapies. In terms of when to order genomic testing, I do not order it in stage three disease. Um, we are trying to develop new targeted therapies on research trials um, for people for whom standard therapies may not be effective. I, I do order genomic testing in some patients with metastatic disease at presentation and sometimes later. And I, the reason I don't do it right away is because cancer is not stagnant. How it Prevents, uh, presents today may not be what it's doing in the future. And when we have very effective therapies that may be beneficial, I like to use those first. If we're at a point where we're saying, you know, we really want to learn more about this cancer to see what may be new or different or research related for this patient, that's when I usually will order the genomic testing. I don't know that ordering genomic testing when somebody's stage three will necessarily mean that's the same cancer if they become stage four. So I like to order the genomic testing at the point in time when I'm trying to look for a treatment that I think will be specific for that person. Um, so I think that this is also a changing area. Um. Right, so that's, so yes, absolutely. If you're, for, if you're going to um, use that combination, of the immune therapy and the, the abraxane, the chemotherapy, you must test the tissue for PDL1. 40% of women will qualify for that. Um, but in terms of broader genomic testing for one of these broad panels, that's what I was referring to. I guess I didn't quite understand the question. Yes, the, that is, um, there, it has now been FDA approved. You just go in to take the biopsy or the tissue itself, and there's a, um, I'm trying to remember the company that's doing it, and I'm blanking right now. Um, 
And it actually is looking for the PDL1 cells that are in the environment of the tumor. But it is a requirement to do that before this drug will be approved because it's only effective in that setting. And then the other question was, do I order a baseline, baseline brain MRI in a stage four patient to rule out brain CNS mets? I don't necessarily do it in everybody. Um, we know that triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer raise the risk of brain metastases. You know, most of the time it causes symptoms. I mean, I think it depends on the, the on a lot of features of the patient, how they're feeling, where the cancer may be elsewhere. I don't know that there's an absolute right or wrong answer to that question. No. I think that's pretty definitively answered no. And or biopsy? No. And I think that's been looked at for years and years and years. And I think if we, if we biopsied breast cancer cells and we thought it would spread, number one, you'd see it, cancer recur all along the line of your biopsy track, which we don't see. And it, there's really no proof that doing a biopsy will spread cancer. And it's critical that we do biopsies to know what we're dealing with to know how to approach the treatment. So no, the answer is no. We don't spread the disease by surgery or biopsies. Well, until a surgeon can remove everything and have it heal, which requires the cancer not be where the surgeon's operating, then surgery won't help you because if you, if you can't get it all out and let the healthy tissue heal, you can't operate. So there are are medicines and radiation that can help treat cancer locally. Well, that, you know, we just talked about a whole laundry list of options. There are so many different choices that it's, you know, with your physician really need to answer that question. It really is based on what treatments you've had before, and the features of your cancer, triple negative breast cancer, as we discussed, is so many different types of diseases that there's really no one answer to that. Sometimes we do biopsy cancer in the skin, but many times we don't need to, depending on what the rest of your situation is. So that's, sometimes we do that. It just depends on the person. We know that about 20 to 25% of the time, cancer types can change when they recur, whether it's going from hormone positive to hormone negative, HER2 positive to HER2 negative, or vice versa. So as a rule, when women have their first spread of cancer, we like to do a biopsy so we know what kind it is and how to treat it. So about 20 to 25% of the time, this does happen. And Finding out what the new cancer is is critical to knowing how to best approach treatments because hormone receptor positive versus HER2 positive versus triple negative or cancers are approached differently in terms of their treatments. I think the bottom line is as long as they're feeling well, and this is true of all treatments we use for recurrent breast cancer, if the cancer is in remission or um, not spreading and people are tolerating the treatments, then the treatment should be continued. Immune therapies, there may be a subset of people who stay on this for many years and the cancer does not spread, and we're trying to tease out who those people are. I think that's one of the promising um, areas of immune therapy, that if we can keep the immune system recognizing the cancer as a foreign part of our body so it prevents it from growing, People may stay on immune therapy for many years. There is a small chance of having a serious autoimmune side effect from that. But in general, I think with these drugs, the people who have done well over time may stay on these medicines, whether it's for breast cancer or other cancers, for a number of years. And we'd like to figure out who those people are so we know what is specific to their cancer that can make these treatments so effective. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, except that these are things that have been found to be seen on the surface of cancer cells over time, and we've learned how to use them to address our therapies or target our treatment. And just like we have ERPR and HER2, we are now coming up with many other features of cancers that are going to help us 
to better define treatment in the future. So it may be that people have one of these other surface markers that defines their cancer so that ERP or on HER2 may just be a fraction of the labels we're going to use in the future to define cancers. <laughs> that's the Nobel Prize winning question there. Why does this happen? <laughs> it's true. There are, that's a good question. Breast cancer is many, many, many different diseases. It's not just hormone positive, HER2 positive, or triple negative. This is scientifically changing so quickly, which is why we're getting so many new treatments. So it's, it's a complicated field, but for all of our cancers, we're learning more and more about their features and how this is changing over time. So I wish it were simple, but it is not. Well, on behalf of the Orange County Susan G. Coleman, I'd like to present Dr. Tedis with a small little gift. Oh, thank you very thank you. much That's for lovely. coming and helping thank us. You. <laughs> thank you.